So oh, we forgot to remind you. <laughs> yeah. What can I say? It, it's got to be because it's a new month. You know, it's first of July, you know, out with All the old and with the new. I don't know. Man. Three off your uh, rhythm. Yeah. <laughs> or Biden. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think I think Biden thing is catchy. So I, I think I caught some of it. But <laughs> but anyway, as as we're studying this and we're looking at the issues that the Corinthian church was dealing with, Paul's coming in trying to get them on track and saying, okay, guys, come on, you know, here's what you need to do. Let me get back up here to where I'm in the right place. Um, here's what you need to do. And so that things are organized orderly and you understand how to use the gifts, when to use the gifts, how they apply, and that one of the things we're going to find out today is that Paul says that the spirit of the individual can control the gift. Basically, the spirit of prophets, uh, here in verse 32, he says, and the prophet spirits are subject to the prophets. In other words, um, oh, I, some, I knew some people were still going to join us. There's Aaron and Mark is coming back. Um, so, you know, I mean, we, we see that you can't say, oh, oops, you know, it was the Holy Spirit that did that through me and I had no control. Paul is saying, no, it doesn't work that way. You can't say, oops, you know, the Holy Spirit just didn't give me an opportunity. And so he took over and he did it all. And so I had no control. So I have no control when I'm in the church body because the Holy Spirit might take over and that's it. When he does, I just have to let him do what he's going to do. Well, Paul's saying it doesn't work that way. So let's, let's go ahead and pick up there in verse 26 and see what he says. He says, what then, brothers and sisters, when you come together, each one has a hymn, a teaching, a revelation, a tongue, or an interpretation. Everything is done, is to be done for building up. Now, if you remember, when we studied uh, the, in chapter 12 about the gifts, remember that the gifts are given by the Holy Spirit to edify the body. If they are not edifying the body, then they're causing confusion. And Paul is saying, that's not good. You need to come in with a plan when you come in to worship the Lord. In other words, don't just come in willy-nilly and basically everybody starts doing their own thing because all you get is a bunch of confusion. If everybody comes in and all of a sudden they're all speaking in tongues together, the issue is, where is the building up of the body? Where is the edification of the body? And so he's saying, well, it's better, he's giving them advice here. He's saying, hey, set up an orderly organization of how worship is going to be carried out. And if you do it that way, then you're structured in a way that when you come in, you know, you're going to end up having something more organized and orderly before the Lord to bring him honor and glory in your worship instead of confusion and misunderstanding. And so that's what he's talking about here as he's going through this. That's why he's telling them when you come in and, and don't we do that today? Usually we have an order to our, our worship when we go into a service. We'll usually sing at the front end. We'll have hymns. Sometimes we'll have somebody go up and do a Bible reading, right? You know, a specific mm -hmm. Bible reading. It's not the sermon yet but a specific word of God for the people. In essence, a, a teaching or maybe a revelation coming from the Bible. That's what we do today. In, in the Baptist church, we don't have people that normally get up there with a tongue because one of the things is we don't use, we don't see that gift in our churches today. Well, and we don't have the interpreter. What he's, he's not saying just come up with a tongue, but it also needs to have an interpreter. Okay, so in other words, so that there's a building up of the body and everything is to be done for building up. If anyone speaks in a tongue, there will only be two or, or at most three each in turn and let someone interpret. In other words, the tongue isn't going to help if nobody knows what is being said in the tongue. So that has to be part of it. If they do have somebody that has the gift of tongues. They need to have somebody also has the gift of interpretation. And sometimes the person with the gift of tongues has the gift of interpretation. 
some would say, well, then why don't they just have the gift of prophecy instead? God does things his own way. I don't know. You know, because you'd say, well, the gift of prophecy would be kind of like what uh, Martin was talking about, you know, a couple of weeks ago where he was saying, you know, in the prophecy, God has a message today. You know, it's not really a revelation in the sense that it's new gospel, so to speak, but he may have a message. And so that's pretty much what you're looking at in that respect. So he's saying, but look what he says. If you don't have an interpreter, if there is no interpreter, in other words, that person, the one who has the gift of tongues, is to keep silent in the church and speak to himself and God. In other words, do it quietly. In other words, we can still pray in a tongue to the Lord and keep it quiet, not out loud, because that just causes confusion, right? And he's saying, but how will you know if there's an interpreter present? Well, that's that's where you, if you know the people that are part of the group, you know what their gifts are. And you know if there's a person with that type of gift. See, I mean, that's where people know each other in the body of Christ. Actually, that's how it's supposed to be. I mean, and when the body, when Christ talks about the unity of the body, is that you're all supposed to know each other and you're supposed to know each other's gifts, know what the Holy Spirit has gifted each person with so that you are a united body that understands what work the Holy Spirit can do in that group of people. And okay. so, yeah, go ahead, Mark. Okay, so we have to make a distinct uh, a distinction here because first of all, we I guess we got to distinguish between language, right, which is what happened in Pentecost, and right. evangelical tongue, I guess we could say that, right? Right. So, and, and, and then not every person that's speaking in, in, in tongue is a prophecy because the Bible says, that's okay, right. you could speak in tongue, I guess, if you do, but you're talking to God. Amen. So not because a person is going to speak out loud in tongue in church, that doesn't Amen. mean that he's bringing a prophecy. Amen. And I believe if, if there's no one to interpret to whatever he's saying, so I guess there will be time that he know, he should start speaking in tongue and say, okay, I'll say the Lord, you know? Because you and me, we know we have seen, I seen a huge discrepancy in the Pentecostal church at the beginning mm -hmm. where people are going crazy yeah. <laughs> speaking yeah. in tongues. And the, that's it, it why was, I asked, no that's what I was noticing. Mm -hmm. No, and, and Martin's right. I mean, because, and, and that's also why Paul says here, if, if there's no interpreter, or if that, in other words, basically, if it is, a heavenly prayer that you're actually doing, then keep it between you and the Lord. And not, like he says, not every utterance is going to be a prophetic utterance. So, I mean, that's where the body of Christ needs to be united tightly to be able to manage that. If, if, they, don't, if they don't know each other, then there's going to be confusion, kind of like what Sally's saying. What, what if you don't know if you have an interpreter? You know, I remember back when Brother Jim was pastor of First Baptist, and a lady got up and started speaking in tongues, you know, in the middle of the service. And Brother Jim told her, ma'am, no, hold on just a minute, you know, because, hey, like right here, Paul says the prophet spirit's subject to prophet, so she should be able, if the pastor says, hang on just a minute, she should be able to stop. In other words, it's not something that just, you know, you got no control over. And so Brother Jim said, uh, hey, is there anyone in here that has the gift of interpretation? Oh, okay. And so nobody in the audience, and we're talking thousands of people, right? <laughs> nobody in the audience <laughs> said, oh, I've got the gift of interpretation. So, so then Brother Jim said, then you should be silent. You know, in other words, pray to the Lord in your language, but do it silently, is what he told the lady, and just had her sit back down. Right, Ted? Yeah, go ahead, Mark. And I will say, I suppose that sister right. was, uh, was used to do that in her own church. Probably. And it, was, it was normal over there. Exactly. Because that's exactly what happened. Someone just got out, get up in the middle of the service and starts speaking in tongues. And believe me, 
emotions get involved because I have oh, seen yeah. it. Yeah, and that's another issue. And I mean, hey, you never know. The Holy Spirit might have just really touched her and she just had that moment. You know what I mean? And to her, that's how she reacted. But it wasn't the right reaction in that group of people, a different group of people, you know. But I mean, one of the things that you find is that what Paul is talking about here is exactly that issue. He's saying that you don't come in just to make, you know, your, your worship a matter of confusion. You know, it's not that each individual might not actually, or I mean, that each individual is indeed, you know, worshiping in a certain way, but not to the point where it disrupts the whole unity of the body. See, and that's what was happening here with the Corinthians. They weren't keeping their gifts under control and managing it in a way, them in a way that it was building up the body. That was what Paul is addressing here, exactly what Martin's talking about. You got to be careful because you can, the Holy Spirit can just take over you or your emotions can take over. And before you know it, you're doing stuff that's just totally not edifying to the body. Hmm. And so that's where you have to be careful. I don't know how many of you have ever attended a Pentecostal church. And I'm not, I don't want to make this a collective statement for every Pentecostal church, but I've been in the Pentecostal churches where, man, I had no clue what was being said or done in there. And it was just a jumble, you know, going on in there. And uh, just like when I listened to you, Ted. Yeah, exactly. Hey, good point. Hey, that was a good comeback, Aaron. <laughs> By the way, welcome, Aaron. <laughs> Thank you, Ted. It's good to see you and everyone else. Amen. Amen. So, these are real things that can happen. And I mean, where human, the human factor gets involved along with the Holy Spirit, sometimes the human gets carried away. And it's not necessarily the way the Holy Spirit wants it done, but we get carried away. It's kind of like Martin was talking about. We can get emotional. And I'll tell you what, hey, have you ever been in a, uh, like a service where there is some great godly music going on? And you, I mean, you just feel the Holy Spirit and you want to jump out and do something. You know what I mean? I mean, it's there. And, and if you don't control yourself, you could just, you could easily be jumping in, down the aisle, running around and praising the Lord, you know, and it may be a distraction to some people. I, I've seen that happen. I've even done it, you know, so I'm not saying, you know, I'm not, you know, one of those, but hey, I've been in Pentecostal churches and sometimes the Lord has really just <laughs> let me let loose. Yeah, yeah. And, and again, I don't think there's nothing wrong with that. No. I mean, I have seen the, uh, you know, I can't, I can't be in New York, so I have seen the Hasidic Jew, oh, how right. they celebrate, you know, they dance. Oh, you know big I mean? time. They get together and they dance, so I'm not yeah, saying man. something. If the, if, they, if the church wants to do that, it's fine, but there's time for everything. But do it orderly, and that's the issue. That's what Paul's bringing out here. I mean, I look at what King David did. Remember when he was dancing before the Lord with all his might when they were bringing in the Ark of the Covenant? Yes. You know, I, I think there, God gets worship when we just, with abandon, you know, turn to him. But at the same time, we need to do it in a way, hey, there could be a time in a service that's set apart for, you know, uh, I've, I've heard people singing to the Lord in another time. You know, and mm -hmm. I'll tell I you, I've, and I've heard it, and it's beautiful. Um, oh, yeah, sounds like angels singing. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah. I mean, there are ways of bringing honor and the glory oh, yeah. to God that are edifying and bring mm -hmm. him honor and glory. And that's what Paul's trying to bring out here. Be careful not to get disruptive, because the whole issue of gifts, and that's what he's talking about here. He's talking about gifts here now, is he's saying that if they are not building up the body because they're being used without control, so to speak, then they're, they're, it's a matter of confusion, and then the body's not being built up. And if the body's not being built up, then the gifts are being used incorrectly as God intends them to be used. And that's why he's telling them, because obviously this was happening in that body. They were just coming into a matter of confusion there, you know, and getting carried away in a sense that was not edifying to the rest of the body. And that's the problem Paul's talking to here. And that's why, and that's why he's given them advice to get their ideas back on track. Go ahead, Mark. 
So I would say the other extreme of that is this now. That I say, I would say some churches, we go to church and now you got people performing out there. You know what? That The church is not for that. We also supposed to participate in worshiping God. We're not going to go just to listen to singers. I don't think the service should be, should be for that. We all supposed to participate. In other words, we're supposed to sing and worship God. It's now, we're not going out there to entertain by the singers out there. And I'll say some churches, <laughs> that's what's going on today. We are oh, being I'd entertained. Say, I'd say in a majority of the churches, to be honest with you, especially yep. the bigger churches that have a big budget, because they can afford those kind of things, and that's what they do. But yeah, I agree. I mean, I, I mean, in the body of Christ, when we come together, there should be a joy and a contentedness and a desire to want to worship him collectively as the body. And that's what brings, I mean, when you look at what it talks about in Revelation, that it's, notice what it says, and the prayers of the saints. It doesn't say each prayer of each saint. It says the prayers of the saints came before the throne, and it was like a sweet savor sacrifice for the Lord. And I mean, the same applies to our worship, to our praise, to our bringing honor and glory to God. Those are, those come before the throne, and they honor God, and they glorify God, and collectively, the more we do it collectively as the body of Christ, I think the more it pleases him to see us in unity because isn't that what jesus prayed to the father in his high priestly prayer in john 17 didn't he say hey lord god i want them to be one just as you father and i are one mm -hmm. now that's a tight unity that's something that says something about coming together and collectively together worshiping god together as martin's talking about not not just to come and sit and be, you know, a bump on the log or a pew warmer, but somebody that's, you know, that can join in with everybody together to bring honor and glory to God. That's worship, you know, that's what it is. And that's what we are to be. And I mean, in that, in that, that's Paul's bringing that out here, right? So he says in verse 29, two or three prophets should speak and the other should evaluate. Now, there is a gift of, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Gift of, not evaluation, but there's a gift, you know, that can tell if the prophecy is false. Discernment. Discernment, discernment. that's it. Yeah, gift of discernment. And basically, that's what he's talking about here. Hey, have a gift of discernment, because you never know. Somebody might be just saying that, kind of like Martin said, out of emotion, they're, you know, trying to say their own message but it's not really a message from God. And see, that's where that gift of discernment would play in. Uh, this is not a message from God. This is a false prophet or something like that. And right. believe me, that happened back. That was happening then, and it can happen today. M many people, you know, I, I use the uh, example of the man who wanted to tell this woman, God revealed to me that you're to be my wife. Well, with it, she might say, well, I have the gift of discernment. And no, that is not a message from God. <laughs> you know, I mean, <laughs> anyway, that's that, that was a humorous he statement. He didn't tell me that. Exactly. <laughs> so, so, I mean, people might have their own vested interest in trying to use that vehicle of prophecy to try to get something they want. It's not really a message for the building up of the body. So, I mean, I'll tell you, when you really put the gifts to work, in a church body, there's a lot that requires organization and proper utilization and the Holy Spirit's use to be able to make sure that the messages and everything that are coming out are bringing God honor and glory and are building up the body. Okay? So, so he says, if two or three prophets should speak and the other should evaluate, but if something has been revealed to another person sitting there, the per first prophet should be silent. So, there's an organization to how these things happen. Now, I don't know why he says, okay, the one that just got the latest message should be allowed to prophesy. You know, basically break in and say, kind of like we did in the military, break, break, you know, here's a new message, you know, and so that person would stand up, the other person would sit down and the latest message would come out. I don't know why God does it that way, but that's, 
that was part of the organization that he was saying. If somebody gets a more recent message, that that is the one that has the priority at that point in time. Maybe it's hot off the wires. Maybe. I don't know. You know, it's, I don't know. You know, I mean, it's, to me, I don't hear the gift of prophecy being used in churches today anyway, in that sense, to where all of a sudden they get an utterance and they stand up and they say, you know, the God has just revealed something to me and it's for, you know, and it's for the church. But I have heard a message, like kind of like what Martin was talking about, where somebody might come up to me and say, hey, God told me so-and-so, so-and-so, and it hit me deeply because I knew what they were talking about fit. You know, it wasn't something that was just kind of out there, but it fit. And I knew it was something that I had been yearning for or I had a need to hear. And it built me up in the process mm -hmm. of hearing that from them. But that's usually a person will approach you separately. And that happened. So those messages do happen today, like Martin was talking about. So, uh, so he says, for you can all call prophecy for you can all prophecy one prophesy one by one so that everyone may learn and everyone may be encouraged so there has to be a message of encouragement you know in and of building up in the prophetic message and like we said last week in the prophecy it has to be something it's it's not like a, you're going to write it down and say okay we're going to add this to the bible now the special right. revelation from God has already been accomplished. We have his word. It's got to follow God's word, okay? It can't be something new that is different than what's already in God's word. His word is established, and that's the word that we go, go by to get to know God. I mean, it's his word is living and sharper than any two-edged sword. It's powerful, right? Hebrews 4.12 talks about that. So what we do is... Today, we get the messages, and we test the messages to make sure they're from God. Are there false prophets out there or false spirits that can give false messages? Yeah. Go on, go on YouTube. You'll see them. There, Where somebody has a prophecy for the day. That's right. And yeah, I'll tell and it's you. like, yeah. Yes, they are. And, and we've got fake. to be careful with them. Yeah. Because, I mean, that's why we need to know our Bibles. I keep saying, know the Word of God. That way, when these things come out, you know, you can quickly, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, somebody had sent me a link to one just the other day, and I was listening to this, and all of a sudden, they were associating this whole coronavirus and the fact that you, you know, that all these businesses and churches had been, you know, told not to assemble or whatever you know, so that it would control. Well, what they were saying was that this was already the end times, and this is persecution uh, from, you know, the world that now we can't go to church. We can't assemble, as God had said in Hebrews. And I was like, I think that's taking it to an extreme because no, there, nobody yeah. has said Christians are the only ones that can't go to church. Christians are the only ones that can't assemble. They're doing it for the greater good to try to keep us safe. Yeah. And, and nobody, we, haven't even, we haven't even begun to see persecution yet. Oh, no, no. And that's <laughs> nope. my take. You know, I mean, we're trying to push something in that hasn't gotten to its full fulfillment yet. Right. You know, we're trying to make it sound like, like to me, if this is persecution, well, hey, bring it on, you know, but there's... Yeah. I don't see this as persecution. Not that anyway, not that specifically. So, I mean, we got to be careful how much we try to spiritualize everything that's going on around us. It's easy to do. It's easy to see, you know, Satan in everything. And I mean, I'm not saying that Satan's not out there and that he doesn't have his agenda to defeat, you know, victorious Christian living. But this isn't it. Believe me, when persecution comes, I guarantee you, you're going to know it. Look at the persecution that the early church went through. When you see persecution like that, you'll know that then we are being persecuted. When people, yep. you know, when our government won't accept that I say I'm a Christian and I love Jesus Christ and I want you to get to know him too and they kill you for it, that's persecution. You know, 
I mean, to me, that's serious. You know, nowadays, if you tell somebody about Jesus and they look at you cross-eyed, you say, oh, I'm being persecuted. You know, that was such persecution, <laughs> you know? And it's like, no, that he just, that's the reality of life. Some people are going to accept Jesus and others are going to reject him. You know, yeah. when you tell them the good news, that's just the type of result and reaction you're going to get from people. So live with it. It's not persecution. It's just what's going to happen. Persecution mm -hmm. is when they jack you up. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they yeah. may take you to jail. They may burn your body. They may, I mean, go back and look at what happened during the real persecution times. Look at our brothers and sisters in Iran that yeah. come to Christ. That's persecution. You know, where when they accept Jesus Christ, they're basically saying, I'm willing to die for Christ. I'm really willing because that's what's going to happen. They, they and their families will be killed even if their families didn't accept Jesus. Our government okay. hasn't started, started the chopping heads off yet. Yeah. Like yeah. they did in, in uh, ISIS, like ISIS was doing. Exactly. exactly. Right. Yeah, Martin. So I always say, look, we, we, we just too, too spoiled and we are too comfortable. We, we cry like exactly. babies here. Yeah. Yeah. I, I was listening to a John MacArthur message this, this week yeah. about, you know, where is, where is to carry the cross? We, we ain't got no clue. Good because, point. To be honest, as a Christian, we are supposed to be dead. Yep. In other words, I don't count anymore. If if we uh, we were to live a, a true Christian life, we don't count. We are That's dead. Right. That's right. We're dead. Basically, yep. we just live. We live for our master. So whatever happened to us is irrelevant. Amen. That's the way we're supposed to be a Christian life. But today, we're looking God forward. Forbid, hmm? We're looking forward to a better country. Amen. Is what, right. is what it comes exactly. Down to. So so we shouldn't be so comfortable. Was Oh, there are persecution in there. Oh, this. Oh, come on, please stop crying. Amen. Amen. Well, as a matter, <laughs> as a matter of fact, I was studying, you know, with the Lockhart Church. I do a study with them. And right now we're going through Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. And I was looking at Matthew 6. Sally was there, too. And we were looking at this scripture here. Um, and we were looking at uh, anxiety, cure for anxiety, right? Mm -hmm. And look at what. I mean, this is what it is. And it's, don't worry. This is exactly what Martin's talked about. Don't worry about your life. It's this life, A, it's here in God. It's, it's this, it doesn't matter once we come into the Lord Jesus Christ, right? It's, the life doesn't matter. But look what he tells us to do over here in verse 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, I mean, that's what we should be doing. That's more important because it's like Andy was talking about. Our citizenship is not here. Mm -mm. Our citizenship's in heaven. So we need to be seeking that heavenly kingdom, which is where we are going. And we need to be building his kingdom. Isn't that what the Lord's Prayer says, too? Doesn't he say, you know, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven? You know, Jesus said that one, too, in his Sermon on the Mount. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, we need to be seeking his kingdom here on earth, dying to self and elevating him to carry out the kingdom message here on earth. That's what it's all about. And so that was one of the problems they were having over there in Corinth, right? And so they, since they are having those issues, you know, Paul is trying to get them to get things organized and in a way that edifies and builds up the church and gets them focused on being kingdom oriented not self-oriented because that's what they were allowing to happen with their giftedness is they were becoming about what's in it for me through the gift that i have i want to show off my gift but they weren't doing it in a way that was bringing honor and glory to god or building up the body and so that's where the problem lie and so paul's trying to get them organize to make this work in the way that brings honor and glory to God and brings orderliness to the worship too. Okay. So, and then he says, um, so prophecy is important that they all may learn and everyone may be encouraged and the prophet spirits are subject to the prophets. In other words, it's not like the Holy spirit takes over and then you're some kind of robot and you can't shut it off. You know, there's no off button. It's like, well, you got to play it out. Whatever the Holy Spirit's going to do, he's going to play it out. No, he's saying 
you can't use that as an excuse. Well, the Holy Spirit took over. I couldn't shut up. Well, no, he's saying that's not the case. He's saying you have control over your body, your spirit, and whatnot. So you can stop if you're asked to stop. And says, he says, since God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. Mm -hmm. So in other words, if, if in the midst of this service, it is not peaceful and upbuilding and uplifting, then something's wrong. Because in and through it all, even with the giftedness, even with the prophecies, even with the tongues, and when it's done in order, there is an uplifting, a building up of the body, a coming together, and a glorifying of God in a way that brings him honor and glory. And that's what Paul's trying to tell them they need to get organized in doing so that that worship is effective and builds them all up and God gets the honor and the glory through it. So you see his reason for trying to get them organized and trying to get them going down a track together so that everything is done in a way that brings God honor and glory and builds up the body. Hmm. Makes sense, right? So, I mean, even in a secular world, do you want to go into a place that's all full of confusion and you're not really getting anything out of it? I sat through some business meetings like that. <laughs> <laughs> um, amen. It's like, why am I here? <laughs> <laughs> it's like, yeah, exactly. Uh, I mean, we used to say that in, in the Navy. It was death by PowerPoint or death by, you know, uh, meeting. You know, more meetings. It's like, oh, man. Yeah. So, yeah. Anyway, crazy. So, then he goes on, continues in verse 33. He says, is in all the churches of the saints. Did somebody text something? Uh, oh, I guess I missed it. Uh, chat. Where is it? Oh, I guess not. Okay. But he says, as in all the churches of the saints, okay, he's talking about the universal church now, all the churches of the saints, not the individual local bodies, but all the churches of the saints. This is what he's saying. Now, this is one of those things that's kind of controversial um, in, in today's culture, because, hey, we look at it as if he's talking to all the women to shut up, basically, right? But he says, in all the churches of the saints, the women should be silent in the churches, for they are not permitted to speak, but are to submit themselves, as the law also says. If they want to learn something, let them ask their own husbands at home, since it is disgraceful for a woman to speak in the church. Or did the word of God originate from you, or did it come from you only? Okay, question. Why do you think Paul is saying this? And do you think it has relevance in the way it sounds like on the surface based on our own culture and based on our own understanding of what he's saying? I'm not stepping in that mud puddle. Uh, <laughs> no, I, Go listen, ahead, Martin. Jackson didn't raise a fool. <laughs> I, I don't think the reason why he obviously wrote that uh, – I had a situation going on. I, I believe that what I heard was that the woman was asking questions during the service time. And obviously, that's nothing applied today. You know what I mean? That's, that, that was a particular situation that was going on in that particular church at that time. That's right. Now, uh, it's okay. There's two issues here that you have to understand that Paul is talking to. He's talking to the issue first, there's a cultural problem. Okay. And the cultural problem goes beyond Corinth. So he's, in a way, he's being hyperbolic in the sense of he's saying that he's speaking to all the churches of the saints. In other words, this is hyperbole. He's just saying that this is a bigger matter than just here at Corinth, okay? What he's saying, he's not telling, saying that wi women have to be silent in the worship of the Lord. He's saying that women need to be silent in disrupting. Now, because if you go back up into chapter 10, he says it's okay. Women can prophesy. Women can do things. As a matter of fact, we see he's even in Acts, it talks about that there are four, these four daughters or three daughters of this one guy that are all prophets. They are prophet women. They speak prophecy in the church and now. So Paul is not making, you can't look up in chapter 10 and say, well, wait a minute. 
this doesn't fit. You know, he can't have it both ways. He can't say the women can there, but now all of a sudden he's saying the women can't here. So you've got to understand what the message is. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah, I'll give you a perfect example. Go ahead. Okay. Today's day. When we go to service, we're not allowed to speak. Right. Are we allowed to talk during the service? No, we are not. Can you ask Pastor Youth, uh, Pastor, uh, uh, can you can you please ex explain <laughs> what are you saying? Right. We can do that. So right. and then in this case today, it will, it, will, it will apply to men and women. We're not allowed to talk during the service. That's, That's right. why we have class like this. That's right. So we and, could express our opinion. And that's exactly what Pastor David has even said. He says, hey, make sure that if you have any issues or questions, and he provides some notes that actually go out to the different life groups and that kind of thing, in case people have questions about what he or Danny or whoever was giving the message talked about that week. So that's right. I mean, what he's talking about, you got to keep in context, okay? What is it that he's talking about here that we've been talking about so far? Confusion and disruption, right? So he, he's still talking about the same thing here. He's not talking about that women are somebody that can't speak in church. What he's talking about is if women are speaking to the point where they are causing disruption by asking questions, by making comments, whatever it is that they're doing, because apparently that was going on, he's telling them, you need to be quiet. So he's talking this message to all the churches, not in the sense of that he's trying to alienate women as being less capable, but what he's trying to do, he's trying to say, if women talk in the church body and it causes disruption, they need to be quiet. That's what he's saying here. Okay. But then again, it's like Martin says, I think even if the men started talking in the middle, he'd be telling them the same thing here too. But in this case, you know, the man is the one that's the head of the wife. So it's his responsibility. So basically he's telling the head, actually that's what he's referring to here. He's speaking more about those that are married. He's kind of exhorting the men to say, hey, you know, basically if your wife starts asking questions in the middle of the service, this isn't the place to start discussing it or arguing it. Wait till you go home and then let her ask her question. And then you can answer it for her because, hey, he's supposed to be the head of the body. He's supposed to also be the spiritual leader for that family. That's what Paul is talking about here. It has to do with disruption, not with the capability of women. It has to do with disruption and disorderliness happening because of that disruption in the body of Christ. See the issue? Wow. Uh, it seems like this church really had a major problem in the oh. service, huh? Man. What was going on? Well, they, they were going crazy. Yeah. People yeah. were speaking in tongues, I guess, jumping, doing crazy things. I mean, it was, yeah. they had a disorder going on during the service. Yeah. And that was the whole issue that Paul's trying to get in under control here. And he's trying to give them advice in ways that will help them. Now, think about it. When he gives advice, it's not something, it's not a Ten Commandment thing, okay? That's what he's doing here. He's giving advice on how to bring this church back into order in a way that builds up the church body. And it also brings, you know, peace into the actual worship. And it also brings honor and glory to God in a way that is reverent, not in a disorderly way, as he said here, right? Because he says, since God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So that's what he's talking about here as he's concluding this chapter. He's not trying to isolate. Don't, don't take personally anything here that makes it sound like he's trying to isolate genders and say one gender is better than another or more capable than another. I'll tell you, when you get into some of the, I mean, I've heard some of the scholars say Paul was a bigot. Paul was, you know, insensitive. Paul was this, you know, chauvinistic male pig, you know, and this is the scripture they use because they take it out of context when they're not looking at the fact that what Paul's trying to do here is he's trying to give 
this disruptive, disorganized church some direction on how to bring their organization into order. He's not trying to demean anybody in the sense of saying, you know, one gender is more or less than another. What he's trying to do is bring orderliness and bring in the fact that God needs to be a God of reverence, not disorder, so that they can experience peace into that unity of that church. That's what he's trying to do. There's two points on that. Number yep. one, you can't judge what Paul said by standards today. Right. You, you can't do it. No. Nope. Okay? And, and that is one of the biggest fallacies that goes on today. It's, it's being shown in tearing down statues. Yeah. Okay. It, it's stupid. Right. And the, the second thing is they don't know what was going on in that church. <laughs> they weren't there. They have no right. clue. Right. You know, maybe, maybe there was quite a disruption going on in a ruckus and he had to stop it Absolutely. because it has to be orderly worship. Amen. So, you know, again, I go back to scholars. I don't listen to them. <laughs> I really don't. But it's sad, you know, that, I mean, all you have to do, though, is once you read in context what it is that's being said, you realize, oh, wait a minute. I can't take this to be a different type of message that isn't the one that he's talking about in that section. See, and when you do that, especially when we look at through our lenses of our culture today, especially in the feministic kind of way of looking at things, what, do you, what would you take if all you're going to do is look at this verse 33 down to 36 alone? Just take it out, you know, do the cherry picking thing, and you were a feminist. If you read that, what are you going to take away from it? That Paul is, a, you know, a bigot. That he is somebody that's insensitive, a chauvinist pig, right? Because that's what it sounds like in our, in our perspective. And that's why Martin is saying, hey, you can't read, or I mean, you're saying too, Andy, you can't read it through the lens of our culture because our culture is different. We look at things differently, you know, than what they looked at them back then. And back then, guess what? The woman was considered subservient to a man period yeah. there was no argument and women wouldn't have even argued that because he says it's, he says it's like just as in the law and if you right. go back and read the law and you look at jewish law right. and, and custom women well, were basically property that's right well and if you <laughs> even go back to genesis you say well what was woman created for by god she wasn't created to subsume man's role. She was created to help man achieve greatness in their role. You see the issue? She, he, she was created as a helper. Not, but now, when the fall happened, and you go back to chapter 3, what does it say? In the fall, the woman was going to try yeah. to overtake the man, and basically, she'd be a thorn in his side is what's going to happen. Yeah, that's part of the fall that causes that dysfunction. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, go ahead, Mark. Yeah, even, even today, I mean, who wants to uh, be taking our context? Let's say you say something to someone and they take it the wrong way. You guys say, no, I didn't mean that. I meant this. Right. And people usually take things the wrong way. Yep. Same thing what, the, what Andy say about it, these people who, with the statue. Yep. You know, it, it's, it's taking things out of context. To be honest with you, if I were at that time, I had money, I probably had slave also. Because it's like, <laughs> it's like having a car today. You have possession. Yeah. You yeah. have a house, you have a car. It was a normal thing to, to, to That's do. That's right. That's right. And it's sad, you know, that we tend to read the Bible through our own cultural lenses. And many people walk away from the Lord because they think, that it's, you know, that God is all in the slave business. God is all in demeaning women. God is all in, because they read it wrong. They don't have the Holy Spirit. And immediately they take what the scriptures say out of context. And it's not what God is saying whatsoever. So, so I mean, that's why I wanted to make a point of that as we talked about it, because it's easy to take the Bible out of context if all of a sudden, it's easy to just say, oh, now look what he's saying. But you've got to look at what it is that he's saying. And he's still talking in the same context, by the way, as we get. Uh, let's read 36 on. He says, or did the word of God. Before, oh, what's that? Before we go on, one thing I want to. Yeah. 
I just say is I'm glad that you clarified that because I had a note next to that in my Bible that said that really surprised me because Jesus had women in his ministry. Absolutely. So when I read it, I kind of read it, I guess, in that feminist, you know, look at it through today's lens versus how you explained it. So yep. thank you for explaining. Oh, you're welcome, you, Tina. <laughs> But you just made my life a little easier. <laughs> it, I'll tell you what, though, isn't it amazing how, you know, it, how quickly people will love to grab the Bible, and then they grab this kind of verse. What about the other verse in Matthew 7, verse 1? Judge not, lest ye be judged. How has that been taken out of context? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it's, it's used by all the secular world to try to jack up a Christian Anytime a Christian wants to say something that sounds like it's against a lifestyle or something like that, well, judge not lest you be judged. You know, who are you to judge, right? I mean. <laughs> My answer to that is I'm not judging it. The Bible's already done that. The and God's I mean, Word's already done that. I'm just telling you what the Word says. Yeah. I'm, I'm the messenger, <laughs> not the writer. But it's, it's amazing how people love to use Scripture to try to justify their own way of sinful living. Yeah. You know, it's like, it's sad. It's sad. But it's because they take it out of context and they use it that way. So, now he says, now look what he says. Or did the word of God originate from you or did it come to you only? In other words, what he's saying is, hey, the word of God came from God, right? And that he and what is are they somehow special that the word of god doesn't apply to them what he's saying is that it goes all the way back to when women woman was created from adam that's what he's talking about when he's saying did the word of god originate from you basically god created man and woman and he's the one that established the relationship issue and so what's the issue you know are you trying to take that and make it something it's not then, you know, so he's not talking here, he's not wrapping up that thought as a matter of what he's trying to say is that the woman was to be the helper as God originated her to be. And so let her help and not in the sense of being disruptive to the body in this type of situation. Not, not that he's demeaning the woman. You know, he's not trying to do that. He's just saying God is the one that accomplished this. Trust God in what he did and be there for her to explain to her what needs to be said so that she's not disrupting the church body in that sense. Now, it's, it's like Martin said. You know, you can say, well, how much was she disrupting? Well, I think for Paul to uh, talk about this, I think many of the women... It's probably a cultural thing that was going on in the Gentile arena. They were a lot more free to speak up than the Jewish women were, let's say, in the Jewish relationship. And so Paul had to basically say, let's do this in an orderly way. Talk to your wife when you go home. Answer her questions at home. Ask her to please be quiet here so that we don't disrupt the service. But yeah. he's not telling the woman to be quiet, period, because otherwise he'd go against what he's saying in, in chapter 10. Go ahead, Martin. Yeah. Ten, well, again, let's go back to Genesis. Yeah. When God created man and woman, did they give me the, the choice to say, you know what? I created you man and woman, but if you want to, uh, you want to change the other side, you have the option. Did he say that? <laughs> no. Huh? Okay. So he didn't give oh, me the option. Let's not right? go down that path. You are, I created you a man. And you know what? Uh, later on, if you want to make a decision and change it to the other side, you're welcome to do it. Wonder what does it say then in the Bible? It, it doesn't, but they're doing that today. <laughs> but I'm with Andy. Let's yeah. not go down that path. Oh man, <laughs> no, no, no. No, this is this is this is part of life that we we're yeah. gonna confront every day. I know because people are gonna say, you know what? Uh, I wasn't happy the way I was, so now yeah. I used to be uh, a he, but today I'm a she. Yeah. <laughs> no, you're still a he. You just Hey, hey, no, don't, not, don't not, not according to them. Yeah. Don't don't even ask and that. God, one. Listen, God forbid you say something. <laughs> Cause I had an aunt an uncle that now isn't or was an aunt. She's passed away. So uh yeah, anyway. Interesting life. But anyway, yes, Allie, I got you. So anyway, so let's move on a little bit more. 
Remember, keep in mind that everything Paul's talking about here is about disrupting and how to be able to organize it so that there's no disruption, but that there's organization, there's worship, there's honor and glory to God, okay? So he says in, in verse 37, if anyone thinks he is a prophet or spiritual, he should recognize that what I write to you is the Lord's command. Now, what he's talking about here is he's wrapping up this chapter. He's talking about the fact that he is an apostle of God, okay? And mm -hmm. so, as an apostle of God, he is the one that has to bring the message that God is telling him to bring. And that's what he's talking about here. And so, he's saying that, hey, I'm not just giving you, I mean, advice in a sense i'm giving you godly direction in how to be able to accomplish this task to make sure that the disruption is not there but yet that the body's being built up and that god is getting the honor and the glory and that worship is being a being done in a way that shows reverence to god and it's not this crazy way that is disrupting people and is disrupting the message and God's work through the Holy Spirit in the body. Okay, see what he's talking about there? So he says, if anyone ignores this, he will be ignored. In other words, hey, if you're gonna ignore God, basically, if you're gonna ignore God's message, then guess what? You're not gonna have, you're gonna break fellowship with God. You're not gonna have the fellowship that you need to have with him because there's disorderliness. And he said up here, God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. So he's saying, you need to pay attention to what I'm telling you here. Get this under control, please. Okay? He so he says, so then, my brothers and sisters, be eager to prophesy, and do not forbid speaking in tongues, but everything is to be done decently and in order. And that's the message. That's the context here. The, everything he's talking about here from verse 28, 26 on down is about decency and order in the church body in a way that builds up and doesn't tear down. Okay, questions or comments about chapter 14 or what we talked about today or clarifications or, you know, disagreements or whatever. Uh <laughs> Yeah, go ahead, Martin. I do have something. Yeah, okay. go ahead, brother. Is there a difference between, let's say, someone who, who gets up in the middle of the service and speaks in tongue, and, and the Bible said you have to uh, ask someone to interpret the message, to uh, another person who is getting up in the middle of the service and starts, starts dancing all over the place? Is, 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 that, is that a difference? You know what? I mean... <laughs> It, it's like you said earlier, Martin, the person that did that, that got up in the middle, probably came from a church where that was acceptable, and that's why they did it. But now they're in a body of Christ, and they're like, wait, I thought all churches were the same. How come I can't do that here? Um, we have so many different denominations and so many different ways of worshiping the Lord in different church venues and in different denominations, I'll, I'll be honest with you, I think if it was just Ted speaking, I go back to the early church and I look at how the early church was that met together every day. And then, you know, and they worshiped with abandon. You know, I, I mean, they, they had a way of coming into the Lord. I think, I, I think Paul said it right. I think we should be able to do what the Holy Spirit lays on your heart. If you want to get up and dance before the Lord, you should be able to. But I think there should be a, a structure in place that says, hey, you know, if the Lord does it, here's a time when we'll do that. You know, as the Holy Spirit, because, hey, it says up here that the spirit or uh, the prophet spirit are subject to the prophet. That means that you can do it. The Holy Spirit lays it on your heart. Wait till the right time. And then, man, hey, do it. Dance together. Kind of remember like Martin was talking about the Hasidic Jews. I mean, that's what the Jews do. If you go to Israel today, they still go out and dance, uh, you know, as they worship the Lord. They go out and dance. Yeah. But 
everything has to be done decently and in order. I think that's the real issue, that if your church body is going to worship God and you want to have a time, you know, of basically just say, hey, it's a time to dance before the Lord. Just let the Lord, you know, direct what you want to do. Just let go and let God, so to speak. Then there should be a time. Go ahead, Mark. So, I mean, I, I see, I, look, I, again, you got to take it in context. The difference between the Hasidic, see, they, they get together and dance. Right. Now, when someone goes out there and, and performs a dance, I am sorry, I disagree. I, I don't go to church to see people dance. Okay. But, you know, I used to dance, okay? okay. <laughs> I used to go dance. So I understand. Look, I don't mind. You and me get together, we dance for God, right? Mm -hmm. But I don't need to see people dancing in front of in, in, in my That's my, my take in, the, in, okay. in, in, in the service, to be mm -hmm. honest. I think it's, it's I, don't, I don't know, anyway. The distraction? Um, well, yeah, I, you know, to me, it's performance again. Oh, okay. I'm so, seeing, I'm seeing, if I want to see a performance, I don't need to go to church. I go, I go somewhere else. Oh, I got you. We I got go what you're saying. To worship the king. I think we're missing the point. Right, right. It's, it's got to be king. glorious. And we're not here to, to watch a show. We're not. Church is not for that. Otherwise, it's not a church. I got you. I got you. Um, so when at First Baptist, when they dance on stage, you think that's more of a performance? There is a performance. Look, for, yeah, for I, I participate in the uh, Christmas tree. Yeah, that, yeah it's a yeah. show. That's a show, and that's fine. Good point. That's not that's not a service. That Good is point. a show that we do for Christmas, and right, uh, everything right. has a place. Okay. Now, if you yeah. celebrate and say we have a birthday going on, you have a, a couple that, or, or a group of girls that want to dance. That is fine, but I think it doesn't belong in the, in the service of God on Sunday. Amen. Amen. Yeah, I mean, well, in our Baptist churches, we sure aren't going to do that because it doesn't fit our mode of worship to the Lord. It doesn't. That's the reality. Um, but I'll tell you what, there's nothing stopping you from going home and dancing in your backyard, giving glory to the Lord, even if your neighbor sees you, you know. And mm -hmm. uh, well, the, like you mentioned before, David, David, he had he had a a, a reason, right? He, the, they, he was uh, the the ark of of the Lord was lost. They, they 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 took it back, and he had a reason to rejoice. Amen, amen. Yeah, but it's not that was not in the temple, was it? No, no, it was out on the street. As a matter of fact, his wife even saw it and told him. You hussy, you were showing off your knickers while you were dancing, and those terrible women were watching you. And so, he yes, said, you know, uh, dancing is, <laughs> is, a, is, a, is, a, is a, a symbol or a gesture of, of, of uh, rejoicing. Amen. Celebration, I should say. Celebration. Amen. So, dancing in that respect is not bad. Dancing in the respect where it's a distraction or it's individually driven, yeah, it's, you're right. I agree with you. But when you do it for the Lord, hey, anything that we do where our heart is right before the Lord and we're doing it to his honor and glory, and it's not a disruption of the body of Christ, I think it's a good thing. I mean, they may, they may do that in the Holy Roller churches, but yeah. we're the frozen chosen and we don't do it. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, that's, but that shows that we have all different types of, of bodies of Christ throughout the United States. Yeah. I mean, there are those that are more open to doing worship before the Lord. There's others, others that are more frozen. To, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I mean, it's, I mean, what we do though, is when we go into worship, we don't want to be a disrupting factor in that worship. So we should understand right. how they worship in that service before you go in. You should understand. Um, just so that there, it's not a thing of disruption and it's not a thing of embarrassment either. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it'd be nice if there was one standard way that we could go into any body of Christ and man, we could just bring honor and glory to the Lord and everybody would be built up as we worship together. And there wouldn't be any limitations to what we could do to the Lord and for the Lord in his honor and glory but the reality reality is it's not that way today i mean it, every church is different each one you go into you kind of have to learn the culture of that church so that you can fit in 
and worship in that church body. You know what I mean? So, and I'm not saying you can't worship with other denominations. Hey, we can't. I've, I've done mm -hmm. it. You know, I'm not saying I've agreed with everything in that specific church body or the way they did things, but I could still get, bring honor and glory to God. I've been to Catholic masses and I still felt like I was worshiping God in there. I didn't feel alienated. I still felt I was able to bring honor and glory to God. I wasn't agreeing with everything that they had or the images and all that, but mm -hmm. I was still able to worship. And I know that I had some brothers and sisters in Christ that were in that Catholic church. You know, they didn't necessarily follow the traditions of the Catholic church, but they felt that they had a ministry of staying there after the Lord brought them out of you know, the Catholicism way into following him. And so that's why they stay. So what about those in church who uh, during song, they throw their hands up in the air and they start dancing around a little bit, especially up on the front row. You know, I know there's one fellow Yeah, I, I, I know what you're talking about. Nothing yeah. wrong with that. As a matter of fact, the Psalms talk about raising holy hands before the Lord and it's, it's a form of surrender. It's a form of bringing him honor and glory. I, I mean, I don't think that's that, that, that much of a distraction um, per se. Maybe to some people it is, but there's nothing wrong with it. If your heart, remember, the Lord looks at the heart. If you're doing it and it's not really, because I mean, is it really disrupting anything? Not really. It may distract some people. You know, if they're paying attention to everything going on around them, it might distract them. But see. Yeah, yeah now, now we could apply that word. We cannot judge <laughs> because <laughs> now, see, that's different now. Because who are we to judge uh, another servant? He's if he's worshiping God and if he's doing for the glory of God, it's nothing we could do. Now, like you said, well, of course you're not supposed to be distracting the service, but running like a maniac out there. But hey, if you want, if the, the brother feels like jumping for the Lord, he's not distracting anyone. He's doing calmly. Who are we to judge? Because he's doing it for God. Amen. Exactly. No, I agree. I mean, and, and that's the beauty of having the Lord, though, is that we focus on him, right? And we keep our eyes on him no matter what. Let your heart drive your worship to the Lord, but don't be disruptive. And, and in a sense, that's what Paul's talking about here. I tell you what, I, I think it would be the most beautiful thing if the universal church of Jesus Christ was the same everywhere. That every place we went into worship, everything was, you know, just a, a haven to come in to worship God and to build each other up and to love each other the way God wants us to and to be unified regardless of where you join in with those brothers or sisters anywhere in the world. But it's not that way. You know, you know, you know that's not going to happen because we are all different. Yeah, and, and not only that, I think God deals with each individual different, same way that He deals with the church. So we don't have to be like, uh, like I call that word, the maniki or, or statue, all this or robots, all the right. same. No, right. because you know what, God right. deals with everybody in different ways. Some people say, look, God speaks to me this way. Why right. ask to me? Right. Are you saying to speak to you that right. way? Some people say, oh. But God speaks to me this way. But that's to you. He doesn't speak to me that way. So he deals with every individual in a different way. Because, you know, I believe God's looking for a friend or for friends. It's up to me and you to get closer to God. The, the closer we get to God, the better it's going to be our relationship with him. We, yeah, we could keep a distant or we could have a, a close relationship uh, with God. It's up to us. Amen. The way I look at it is when the Bible talks about one body, many parts, you can look at the local body and each of us is a part of that body. But I think you can take it on a universal scale and look at it and say that, that there are different churches which build, which build different functions for people. And as long as there's 10 to 12 non-negotiables that every church should have. And, if, and, and as long as they're down with those 10 to 12 non-negotiables, the rest of it is kind of, it's not trivial, but it's, it's, it's not, it's not the non-negotiable. It's not going to break up our fellowship. Exactly. The, 
But you know, it, the other says, things well, are going to well, break up our fellowship. We can't fellowship with each other if we can't stand on those points that can't be argued. Yeah, there, exactly. those are called primary and secondary and tertiary biblical issues. You know what I mean? But, you know, yeah, non the primaries are the non-negotiables. That's the gospel of Christ. That's Jesus, you know, coming to yep. earth. That's Jesus dying on the cross. That's Jesus being our salvation. He's shedding his blood. Jesus was he, he was both God and man. He He's is the God and God. man. He's born. And the person. Bible is all um, inspired by God. That's right. It's his inerrant word. And yep. absolutely. And, Amen. It, and as Donna is saying, salvific. You know, it's, it's that salvation is only through Jesus Christ. There's salvation in no other name under heaven. You know, I mean, it's all through Jesus and what he did. It's about the love of the Father and sending his son. I mean, there are foundational issues that, yes, they, I mean, you're not a Christian if you don't, if you don't accept those foundational issues and make Jesus Lord of your life. If you don't get to that point, then I don't care what building you attend. It's not a church if you don't believe those foundational things. So you're not the universal body of Christ at all if you haven't accepted those foundational elements of biblical reality about how to be saved, how to come into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ, and then how to grow in him too. You know, Tina so, and I, when we first moved to South Florida, we attended uh, a church of Christ uh -huh. a couple Sundays. Days. and uh and they are a musical they do not play musical instruments yeah yeah okay we sing hymns and we sing them out of the hymn book and it's the standard standard hymns like we sing at first baptist right but acapella. they don't use music and and acapella and they yeah. say the reason is because it's not in the new testament nowhere in the new testament does it say that we're to worship god with instruments but you know they 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 still believe in the 10 to 12 non-negotiables so I'm not going to break fellowship with them because of that. Right. right. If that if that's how they worship God and, and they are most comfortable worshiping God and it's, it's by the book, so to speak, who am I to say something? Exactly. Now, we, we, we didn't go there because, well, I like a little music, you know. <laughs> Instrument music. Orchestra, yeah. I'm not so that sure isn't about. your acapella, huh? <laughs> Well, that uh, acapella people can hear me singing, and that's just that's just wrong. That is wrong. <laughs> that's really wrong. That's really wrong for everybody. That Definitely making a joyful thing. noise unto the Lord. Uh, well, <laughs> I'm glad he considers it joyful because yeah. this one doesn't. <laughs> well, I mean, you know, we're all different, but I'll tell you, before the Lord, it's what our heart is doing that matters. You know, when we sing to Him. It's our heart singing, not necessarily our vocal cords that are the metric, you know, for people. So, hey, I, hey, believe me, I know what you're talking about, Andy. Not a problem, brother. I'm with you. And uh, right, Marco? <laughs> Martin? Yes, yes, Dad. How you guys doing? <laughs> doing well, brother. <laughs> yeah, we, we were talking to Lori that we went oh. to. Joyce Meyer, Meyer. Uh, oh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Joyce conference. Meyer classes. Yeah, conference. Oh, conference. Okay. And then she suddenly started talking tongues with a group of people that, but we couldn't understand anything. Like, uh, what is this? Yeah. <laughs> and the Bible say it's supposed to be somebody translate what Inter they interpret what they yeah. what they're talking about, but Otherwise, we, but we, yeah. we just didn't understand anything. Yeah. So, know. did it do you any good? No, no, it was no. just yeah. Well, and they, that's what Paul's talking about here. Yeah. That there's nothing wrong with tongues or the gift of tongues, mm -hmm. but it, if it doesn't edify the body, then keep silent, go do it on your own. Yeah, because then it's just confusion because you guys were confused. Yeah, yeah. We're, like, we were confused because we've never been to a church, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right? Right, yeah. It was yeah. very confusing for us. We didn't even know what's going on. Well, and, and that's exactly what Paul's talking about here. You know, it's a matter of let everything be made. Remember what he said? Everything is to be done decently and in order. 
Well, decently means you understand each other, right? Mm -hmm. And so, so yeah, I mean, there's no question that Joyce was probably having a, a moment with the Lord, and that's all nice and good, but it, it wasn't doing you guys any good. Exactly. And so, and that's what Paul's yes. talking about. And we respect, you know, what yeah. you know, that was our first and last. <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. Understandable. As a friend of mine said, your Christian butt was out of there, right? <laughs> <laughs> Understandable. I had a, a friend who went to a church, and when they started doing that, he said, I couldn't get my Christian butt out of that church quick enough. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, Martin. See, the problem with that is, again, what I've seen in the past is it just gets out of control. Yeah, and and, exactly. and it, beca it becomes a routine. I think, in my opinion, I'm not, again, I'm not judging, but a lot of people, it just becomes a show. It just, to say, I, I'm, I'm basically more spiritual because I could speak in tongues. So they get up there. It's like, okay, I, I heard people on the radio, having a, a radio program. Why are you speaking in tongues on the radio? Why? It's, it's, not the, it's not the problem. It's not the right thing place if you're going right to do it venue. do it quietly if you have a, i mean why are you going to go on the radio to speak in tongue who's going to like the bible said and apostle paul, apostle paul said who's going to understand what you say right. who's going to be edifying by you speaking in tongue it's like if you, if you speak in chinese or, or japanese well it sounds okay but guess what i don't, I don't know what's going on yep. so i'm not being edified that's right and that's the whole well, and i think it goes like with um ted talking about when he go to the four square church and with me, it was when we went to the Assembly of God Church where they would say, oh, here, you got to speak in tongues. Let's teach you. We start out with da 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 And so I think some of these people with these prophecies and all, I think it falls right into that re regime that, oh, yeah, let's show that I've got this gift. And so, therefore, I'm a real Christian. Mm -hmm. They're edifying themselves. Yeah. 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 And, now, I mean, I'm not saying I just want to make sure that it's clear. That gifts are of the Lord. There are gifts of prophecy. There are gifts of tongues. Mm -hmm. There are these gifts, but they are to be done orderly and in a way that brings honor and glory to God. And it builds up the body. That's the whole key of the gifts. If the gifts are not building up the body, then they're not being used in a Holy Spirit edifying way. Because the gifts are from the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is there to build up the individual as well as to build up the body of Christ. If that is not happening, then the gift is not being active or it may not even, it may be a false gift that somebody is mimicking. Got to mm. be careful with that. You know, it's got to be the Holy Spirit that's doing it because that's where giftedness comes from. It's not from us. It's from the Holy Spirit. So, right, I kind of think of the sorcerer that wanted to pay money to buy power of healing from Peter. Si yeah, that, yeah, Simon, right? Yeah, Simon, Simon the sorcerer. sorcerer. Yeah. I mean, yeah, some some people, and I agree with Martin. We've got to be careful because it can become a show, and it's not in the show. It's in the relationship and our walk yeah. with the Lord. It's about edifying the body. It's about bringing honor and glory to God. Yes. When used properly, they are absolute wonderful tools and should be used in the church. But as he said, everything is to be done properly and in order. Mm -hmm. That's the issue. God is not a God of confusion. No. Nope. Well, so we don't put Andy up on the stage to sing and lead the singing? No. No, 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 no. no. <laughs> That'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> Tina agrees. I see her back. Holy laryngitis. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I saw you, Tina. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, nobody wants that. Nobody no. wants that. Yeah. So, and praise the Lord. Sing. Hey, look, uh, we're not going to go into 15 today because he, he changes topics now. He starts talking about the resurrection. Um, so we'll, we'll pick up on that next week, but I mean, the resurrection is an important topic that we have to understand because the resurrection, the resurrection that Paul's talking about here, he's not talking about Lazarus. He's not talking about that son that was, in, you know, uh, dead and the funeral procession was going on that Jesus raised from the dead in Nain, N-A-I-N, you know, 
He's not talking about those people that Jesus brought to life or that Elijah brought to life. Remember the, the child that he brought to life, you know, the, the widow's child. Um, those were resuscitations. You know, they were brought back to life at the time, but they died again. What this resurrection is talking about is what happened to Jesus, right? Mm -hmm. Jesus' resurrection is a the the forerunner of what our resurrection will be at the end, right? The dead in Christ shall rise first, and then those who of us who are alive will go to meet him in the air. We will be transformed in the twinkling of an eye. We're talking about the final resurrection. Remember, even when Jesus talked to Martha, just before she was going, he was going in to see Lazarus in John chapter 11, remember she even said, oh, I know that he will rise again at the last day. He will resurrect again at the last day. Jesus mm -hmm. said, oh, no, no, no. I am the resurrection and the life. No man, right? Comes to the Father except through me, and I'm the one. So the issue is that this is the resurrection we'll be talking about next week. Okay, we're not talking about resuscitation here. We're talking about resurrection and what we are to be. And actually, in a sense, we are brought to life. Well, we're not resurrected, but we are brought from death into life spiritually, mm -hmm. you know, but that's not really a resurrection. So I'm jumping off topic there. But. I was thinking about the subject today. Yeah. Uh, 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 us who are alive. He's going to bring up after the uh, those in that are dead. Can you imagine going down the interstate and all of a sudden there's no driver in the car? I'm telling you, chaos that's going to cause. <laughs> Rut row. How about the plane with no pilot? Yeah, we talked about that too. Yeah, this is your captain I'm speaking. I'm being <laughs> the co-pilot and I are. On the way down, you got five minutes to make up your mind. <laughs> <laughs> oh man but i'm going to yeah. give you a parachute jesus is the son of god and you need to believe <laughs> Amen. okay any other questions comments additions subtractions disagreements nope about orderliness and uplifting in the body yeah. amen i do have one question yeah go ahead Andy. just kind of looking ahead here are we going to uh, pick up in Second Corinthians after this study. That's that's my plan. Okay, I'm just curious yeah. because actually, I mean, there's a tie, you know, like yeah. uh, between first and second, uh, and I mean, it gives us a bigger picture too of what how they have matured or not matured, what issues still remained, you know, between First Corinthians and Second Corinthians. So yeah, I think it's it's apropos okay. to follow it on. Yeah, cool. Ted, I just yeah, want to add that, uh, you know, this church that have this service that, that is still going on today uh, with this disorder in their church, they, they, don't, they don't read the, uh, this passage. I don't know that it's there, but it's right. not being applied. That's right. That's right. And, and that's sad. Because, but I mean, do you think maybe they are, they feel like they are having order? That is their order for their church? Well, yes, because remember, the way they think is this. Anything that happened with the Holy Spirit is okay. Because you know what? If you get up in the middle of the service and jump and do crazy things, that's the Holy Spirit. You have to let the Spirit take control. That's, and I guess that's where that's I was confused, caveat, too. Yeah. And Ted clarified that, that the Bible shows that, no, you have control of it. You're not, like, taken over by an alien or something, which is the way I was raised um, with the Assembly of God Church. And my mother's the one that taught us like that so i was a little confused with that now like you're bringing it up martin now it's making sense to me it, it, it's all about educating people it, the same thing i think the churches today are not uh, the, the new the new uh congress are not being uh uh taught that the the, the uh the doctrine of the church the, the, of the bible i should say they just they become a christian they got us they got us on the service and that's about it and to be honest, do a survey. Do a survey in church. See how much I know. I'm not saying that we know, but <laughs> at least we're trying to learn. No, I know I know what you're saying, Martin. We're a very shallow, you know, we're a very shallow Christian community, as it were. And Donna had mentioned that when I was talking to her, you know, about 
the United States being 3,000 miles wide and Christianity, but only an inch deep. You know, it's, you know, for the most part, people claim that they're Christian, but what do they really know about the Lord Jesus Christ? And how much are they just kind of led around, you know, on a hook with, and they're trusting whoever's behind a pulpit at their church as to their spiritual guidance for their lives. And I just on had, a Sunday. Yeah. I kind of had a uh, discussion Monday night with Pastor Jimmy on something similar to that. Yeah. And uh, he was saying that 20% of the people who come on Sunday refuse to wear a mask. They just, they absolutely will not put it on and they won't mm -hmm. do it. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, don't they understand that it's not to keep them from catching the virus, it's to keep them from spreading the virus. And he said, yeah, they know that. And, and my comment was, well, why are we letting them in church? And he said, well, you know, you can't do that. And it's like, well, wait a minute. I could sit here and I can name four, right off the top of my head, I can name, find, name four verses out of the Bible that says that maybe they should because they're endangering people, other people by not doing it. Okay. And it, it's not about personal freedom. That's got nothing to do with it. We, yes, we have freedom in Christ, but if we're taking our freedom and, and we're hurting someone else with our freedom, we're to put that freedom away. Paul says it. And also Jesus said that we are to love our neighbor, love our neighbors as ourselves. Well, if my neighbor neighbor starts coughing on me, you know, <laughs> come on. It's like he loves you. Yeah. Okay. Well, I don't want that kind of love. I'm sorry. Well, he, but, he has scribes to the verse it's better to give than to receive. Yeah, he, he's giving you their germs. Why not? That's it's a good thing. Yeah. He's sharing. And, and so I'm I'm like, you know, seriously? Yeah. You know, it's like yeah, I understand that, Donna, that there's a lot of people with breathing problems. But the whole thing is, it's you still potentially can spread the virus because you're not wearing a mask. And if that's the case, then don't come to church. Okay? Because yeah, you're putting right. other people you're putting <laughs> yourself ahead of other people. And that's not the way we're supposed to do. And again, that goes to what you were saying, Ted. I write that I put that down to a shallow Christianity. They don't know the Bible. And because if they if they knew the Bible and they tried to live their lives by the Bible, they say, you know, I may not like it, but it's the right thing. And the Bible says that if you're doing, if you know the right thing to do and you don't do it, you're sinning. That's James. Boom. <laughs> yeah, I mean. I don't get it. I know. But that's a culture thing. Remember I said that the culture, the world culture has come into our churches? That's, yeah. what, that's what that is. It's the American culture, you know, and they, they're trying to hang on the American culture is the reason they don't have to put their mask on. I have freedom. Well, it's, that's the American culture freedom. But the Christ culture freedom is I will do what needs to be done to edify the body. The and so, your citizenship. And so, I mean, I, I agree with Donna. Donna says she stays home. You know, I mean, that might be the best. I mean, hey, the, the messages are being streamed. It's not like you're going to miss out. But see, some people, many of our Christian brothers and sisters need to warm a pew, you know, and, and, and it's not in the pew warming that you develop Christianity. Right. You know, it's not like you grow in the Lord because you're in that building. It's about how is your heart before the Lord? What is your focus? What are you looking toward? And in this time, hey, I, I know God's not up there saying, uh-oh, oh, Ted did not attend the building this week, X. You know, oh, he got a gold star two months ago he attended. You know, yeah, it's... It's been revoked. God's, well, then you would be a Jehovah's Witness. <laughs> <laughs> You've so, got uh, more, more check marks and X's. As long yeah. as you got more check marks and X's, you're good. That's the works thing, right? So Exactly. So, I mean, we keep our focus on the Lord. And, I mean, yes, I, I guarantee you we're going to run into issues where people aren't going to agree because we're human. And, and, yeah. and that's yeah, the point. That's the, we all have different opinions. And, and look, I, I, I agree with what you're saying. But at the same time, the other coin of that is, 
koinonia, the communion of the saint. Okay, it's like, well, let's change our, let's change a little bit. Why do people pay tickets to go to go see a game? Why can't they just watch it on television? Well, there's there's a difference being there in person. Same thing as the church. I understand what we're going through right now, but I, I'm, I'm attending the service because you know what? I want to say to stay at home if I could go to church. It's not the same. Right. The, you know, the, it's corporate worship is called. And, 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 and again, we're going to meet, we're going to go to church to worship together and we're supposed to go and meet God there. Right. So I understand because of what's going on now. Yes. It's, if you can, you don't need to go. That's fine. But, you know, I'm, thank God I, I've been attending, which has been great. Right. Well, I mean, Donna also asked the question, you know, if we do the social distancing thing, which is six feet apart, do you have to wear a mask and your social distancing? I mean, that's what, you know, we're recommended in terms, but the latest that the government put out, the latest at least that's coming out from the federal government is that we should all wear masks all the time. <laughs> now yeah. it's like, don't even think you shouldn't, you should, you know. Don't but let the President Trump. Yeah. And, 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 and again, look, I, as my opinion, look, if I'm going to a, a supermarket, I'll wear my mask. But if I'm going to be outside by myself or walking around, I don't think I need no mask. This is crazy. You know what this is? You wearing a mask? You know how uncomfortable that is. Okay, you look like uh, someone uh, from, someone from the, the Muslim. Okay, you guys feel better now? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Anyway, I'm sorry. I, I'm. I just. <laughs> I just have. You know. I mean. There you go. At some point, we just See have to later, finally Donna. just say. Yeah. Oh. Listen, you, I'll you, catch you, you later, moved. Donna. God bless my sister. I'm not trying okay, to make I, fun or light of what you're saying. I mean, well, it's just... I was also thinking with the six feet apart, sometimes people don't respect that. And sometimes, you know, let's say getting out of church, getting out of the auditorium, people yeah. aren't going to stay six feet apart. They're going to come closer. I no, mean, I know well, it's only well, trusting honest, the Lord, know, the, but. The, the first service, I mean, remember the sanctuary hall is what? 5,000. I think we had last Sunday less than right. 150 people there. Right. So, so we were so far, uh, far, you know, sitting so far apart, sir. And and and, and my the, the road of the bench I was there, we only I only had like a couple so far away from me. So there's plenty of distance. Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'll tell you, like I said, it's it's a different normal that's going on right now. And until things get back to some semblance of how it used to be, we've mm. got to live in this environment. And, yep. you know, I mean, as Christians, we need to be able to say, well, Lord, whatever you want me to do, mm -hmm. you know, that's what I'll do. Because okay. it's yeah, in yeah, respecting yeah. each other, too, you know, love your neighbor as yourself. So, yeah. okay, we have to respect that. I don't want that person to get sick in case I'm a carrier, right. you know, yeah. so... That's what I try to tell people is, I'm, you know, I'm wearing a mask because you don't know if I got it or not. I don't know if I got it or not. I may not feel it. I could be asymptomatic or I just haven't shown symptoms yet, but I'm not wearing the mask for me. I'm wearing it for you. So yeah. that if I do have it, there's less of a likelihood that I'm going to spread it to you. Exactly. The same thing with me. I work, I go every, every day, I go every different houses. And they ask me, nobody's sick here. Yeah, nobody's sick, but I'm protecting you from yeah. me because right. my wife works in the hospital and I go a lot of places. I don't know if I have it, so I'm protecting you from getting right. the corona. If yeah, I yeah. have, you know, yeah, that's yeah. The, that's my explanation. And yeah. because you wear the mask to no spread, not to, to you know what I mean, not to get a, a virus. Yeah. So. Hey, and it makes us it makes us look better. <laughs> <laughs> You're an accessory. Look like a Taliban. <laughs> They're the new accessory for women. Go yeah, for it. Yeah. I got yeah. one that's got stars and stripes. Well, on. I saw one at the store the other day. She had it all bling blinged out. It was cute. <laughs> <laughs> I, I that's fancy. <laughs> I, and I thought her, I said, that's really cute. You've got it all bling blinged out. <laughs> <laughs> Tina's looking for a leopard print mask. Sweet. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Designer masks. Yeah. 
That's the new thing that's making money right now. I see all these ads coming up with all these different people making their different masks for ten dollars. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, then, do we have prayer items? Let's have some prayer items, and uh, we'll pray. I'm good. Okay. I'm good. Praise the Lord. God is awesome. Mm -hmm. All the time. Yes, He is. Hey, Aaron, how are uh, uh, your daughters doing? Now he's probably away from the thing there, but uh, his mic is turned off. Tomorrow, yeah, well, it's on. He just doesn't. Yeah, he's. Are, they're gonna put a roof in our house. When? Tomorrow they're gonna do it. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, we'll be praying for yeah, good gonna, weather for you. Yeah. yeah. They're gonna do it in one day. <laughs> so oh also, yeah, they're fast. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I said, how many of you guys are coming? A hundred. <laughs> 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 they work like horses. I mean, they get up there and they walk like it's a flat piece of ground. Yeah. And they've got their business of how to pass each thing up to everybody. And they get everything set up on the roof. And then they just start going, walking like they're on the ground. And it's just like four or five of them. And they get it all done. Yeah. It's like, wow. I, I, didn't, <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't pay any money uh, at all yet. And I told them, so do you need a check from the bank? I said, no, your check is okay. So I said, what? <laughs> so much, how much money in one day? Are you going to do it in one day? He said, yeah, we'll do it in one day. <laughs> 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 it's a lot of money. It's not, a, it's not talking yeah. about me. It's a lot of money. Dude. Yeah, yeah. Why? One yeah. Day? We'll see. Well, Sherry got her new roof put on last week. That went well, so praise the Lord for that. So uh, we're fighting with the other roof in my other house, so we'll see what happens. <laughs> Tell these guys to go fix that one too. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well then let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for an opportunity to come together to study your word. I know that we don't do giftedness very well in our churches today, um, or at least not in the Baptist church, and yet. It's something that's important, and it needs to be done in a way that is right and proper. So we look to you, Lord, that you would give us wisdom, direction, and build us up in a way that we can take advantage of everything that the Holy Spirit has to offer. I, I sure would love for our churches to enjoy all the benefits that you have, and I think we're kind of running short on some of the benefits we could have because of the fact that we don't carry out everything that you have for us to do. So Lord, I just pray for your direction and guidance as we go through this, but more than anything, Lord, that we would be organized, respectful, and, you know, just loving to you in our worship services and in the way we carry out our worship before you, Lord, so that you will always get the honor and the glory and that we would indeed grow and become more like Christ in everything we do, because that's what you want, Lord. That's your will, Heavenly Father, is that we mm -hmm. be conformed to the image of your Son. So, Lord, that's what we look to, and we ask that you would help us develop and grow in a way that brings you honor and glory. And let us heed to what Paul's talking about, to do everything in order, in a way that honors and glorifies you, and that way we can experience your peace through our worship to you. Now, Lord, I pray for Marco and Lori as they're going to get a new roof tomorrow. Lord, keep the weather in, in a good way so that they can get that done quickly, as they're saying in one day, and that they can have their new roof and, and you know have it in place so that if we do get any of these tropical conditions come our way, they're, they're ready to be able to take them on, Lord. Because their house is your house, just like my house is your house. All of our homes are your home, Lord. So we mm -hmm. look to them and, and thank you for providing them for our, you know, our respite and the fact that they protect us because we look to you in and through it all. Now, Lord, you know, I know we have other prayer requests that may deal with families and issues, you know, related to family. I, I bring them all before you. You know what our needs are even before they're on our lips. And I ask you to just be involved in all of our families let us be a witness to them and that we would show your love in a wonderful way lord i pray 
Now, Lord, I pray that you would be with us as we go and that we would keep our eyes on you. I love you, Lord, and praise you in all that you've done for us and continue to do for us. Thank you for your love. I praise you and glorify you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. 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 Hey, Ted. Oh, yeah, Aaron. Hey, I, I could hear you. I just had to reconnect my headset, which has the microphone on it. Oh, and I, I couldn't get to it in time to gotcha. respond. You were getting ready to ask me a question. Yeah, Sorry I was just going to ask how your daughters are doing. Uh, they're doing great. And uh, Lauren's going to be retested again tomorrow. Okay. Well, praise so She's Lord. doing fine. Yeah, she's doing great. Thanks for. And she's feeling good? Oh, yeah. So awesome. She went. She went jogging with her on a run walk with us yesterday. Oh, good, good. Is her taste factor back? Uh, well, it's, if you go by how much she eats, it's got to be back. <laughs> or she Let's keeps try. trying to eat a lot to try to taste something. Oh, uh, I got gotcha. you. That's, that's the reason. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. Well, good. That's good to hear. Praise the Lord. You have a, a warning, though, about yeah, ahead, these Eric. face masks. Uh -huh. I'm not going to get too involved into it because there, there is a lot of debate about it but there is some certainty on its restriction of the oxygen level in your body depending on the type of mass so especially rigorous activity it's you know you're going to burn up more oxygen so you're not going to get enough and it is harmful to not get proper oxygen so you have to be careful wearing the mask well that's why they're saying not to use it during exercise and also not in a car because sometimes um Hot, you know how someone can kill themselves in their car with those fumes? God, if you have a mask monoxide. on, that can happen in the car. Oh, okay. Well, it can lead to other problems, not just weakening your immune system, but it, if people have a heart condition or some other ailment, it could right. really aggravate it and cause other... Well, I mean, if you don't have oxygen, you're going to die. Yes, but oh, I mean, oh, just reducing it, there, there are yeah. levels when you get... OSHA yeah. even has guidelines on the levels that are acceptable or not. Right. And these yeah. masks get you below that. Yeah, I only put them on when I'm actually mm -hmm. with people, you know. Yeah. Otherwise, right. yeah. you know, if I had it on 24 hours a day, yeah, maybe that'd be a problem, you know, but I don't. Yeah. So. Even when I go to a drive through window, I'll put it on. Right. That's and, what it's, I it, and I do it, one, to try to protect that person, but also, two, just to let them know that I am concerned about them and, okay. and just make them, them feel a little more comfortable. Amen. And that we're because grateful that they about. are there to allow us to be there. Yeah. Good, good night, night, Lori. Lori. Good night. Good night, Marco. Yeah, good night, Marco. God good bless night, you guys. Have good a good night. night. Good luck with your roof. Yeah. See you. Bye-bye. Okay. Yeah. Bye-bye. Night. Yeah. Night, Dad. Good night there, Margaret. Good night, Margaret. Yeah. See you well, all you know, all Andy. Well. You know, Andy. Everybody. Love y'all. You know, Andy. You said you hey, can't good sing. Good night, Andy. Yeah. Good night, Victor. What, what was that? You know how you night? said you can't sing, yeah. Andy. So long, farewell. Yeah. My I mom. I hate to say goodbye mm -hmm. to you. See? To you. My mom you, had a melodious you, voice. You. Girls didn't inherit it. My brothers <laughs> did. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. I, I hear that. Yeah. yeah. You yeah. heard that? Uh oh. Shame yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Ted, the singing brother. Oh no! And both the brothers. Yeah. All right. Good night, good guys. Night. Thank you. Okay. Good night, Mark. Good night. Hey, God bless you, my brother. Love you all. Care. Good night, Love you guys. Be safe. Good night. Good Bye. night. Amen. Bye. Bye, Bye, Aaron. God bless you. Yeah. Well, okie dokie. Well, good night again, Margaret. God bless you. Bye-bye. Good night. Yeah. Bye. See you. What? Saturday? Yeah, Saturday. You got it, my sister. Bye-bye.